welcome to today's Patients Are Asking program. I'm David Wallace, founder of PD Reporter and our nonprofit sister organization, MPN Cancer Connection. I'm a patient advocate living with polycythemia vera, PD, since 2009. We would like to thank our sponsors, Armacentia, Abby, and Bristol Myers Squibb for their support of today's program. But we're really excited to have Dr. Angela Fleischman, Associate Professor, Department of Medicine at UC Irvine. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm excited to, to talk with you today. Excellent. So walk us through the treatment options for someone living with myelofibrosis and when might a clinical trial be advisable? So from my perspective, um, each myelofibrosis patient is very unique, and so their treatment should also be unique. Um, each person should identify what they think is most important for them to tackle with their myelofibrosis. For example, one person may have a problem with anemia, but not necessarily have a large spleen or a, 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 a huge symptom burden, whereas another person may not necessarily have anemia, but they may be very um, impacted by their large spleen and their symptom burden. So I think first and foremost is identify what each person wants fixed, um, and then really tailor the treatments towards, towards that goal. Um, our JAK inhibitors are very good at relie relieving symptoms and improving spleen size, but may not necessarily be an ideal approach for somebody whose primary issue is anemia. So I think that that makes myelofibrosis to me a very interesting disease, but they can also make it very complicated. Um, in, in terms of current FDA approved drugs, we do have three JAK inhibitors now for myelofibrosis, which can be very helpful. And um, most recently uh, we had pacritinib uh, approved which fills the niche of um, giving a JAK inhibitor um, that's available for patients with very low platelet counts, um, which um, was not available previously because unfortunately one um, potential side effect of uh, other JAK inhibitors can be to reduce the platelet count. So it may not have necessarily been appropriate for people with very low platelet counts. Now the anemia in myelofibrosis is, is quite a challenge um, many patients are given um, transfusions as needed. Um, we can try certain drugs for anemia, but not necessarily one has great efficacy. Um, there are uh, a, a jack, is the jack inhibitor momolotinib being developed um, that may uh, potentially improve anemia. Um, and people can try things like growth factors or danazole, um, but not necessarily with great hopes that those are going to fix the anemia problem. Um, and you had asked about clinical trials. So because we honestly don't have a huge portfolio of drugs that are currently FDA approved for myelofibrosis, we really do need new clinical trials to help develop new drugs. And there are many clinical trials being developed um, for myelofibrosis. And importantly, um, you know, to address the anemia, which is, has been an unmet need in, um, in myeloproliferative neoplasms uh, thus far. So I would say that it's reasonable for patients to, to start with standard of care and, you know, see if that works great for them. Great. Um, but if, if, you know, if they're lacking in terms of um, standard treatments that are really addressing what they feel um, they need addressed in their myelofibrosis, then a clinical trial is, is really very appropriate. For, for, for patient. So research has linked myoproliferative neoplasms to a predisposition to autoimmune disorders such as lupus, Crohn's disease, and psoriasis, um, really just to name a few. And typically, inflammation is a common feature. So um, why do you think this predisposition occurs and might new research development in one of the autoimmune disorders also have a positive impact on MPNs? 
That is a great question and something that I've really focused on um, throughout my career and really will continue to focus on for the rest of my career because it's such a, a big topic. Um, the, the fact that autoimmune diseases um, predate a myeloproliferative neoplasm in many cases made me think that um, the chronic inflammation creates an environment which is very conducive to the growth of these mutant cells, which does seem to be the case. Um, actually, uh, research is coming out that not only um, does inflammation promote the growth of the JAK2 mutant cells, it's also a common scenario for other um, mutant cells that, that, um, that cause other types of um, hematologic uh, cancers, uh, such as the TET2 mutation. So it's, I think it's a common theme that these um, mutant cells that lead to uh, blood cancers grow better in the, in the context of inflammation. Um, another thing that my lab is very interested in evaluating is whether certain abnormal, I don't say abnormalities, but maybe an overactive immune system, um, which leads to autoimmune diseases and which also may um, predispose somebody to develop, develop a myeloproliferative neoplasm may be sort of the central issue in families that um, where multiple people develop myeloproliferative neoplasms. So I, I think that there's a lot of research coming out. We're not quite sure exactly how inflammation may um, promote myeloproliferative neoplasms and other blood cancers, but I think, you know, we're, we're learning um, learning um, significant amounts as, as time progresses. Um, interestingly, JAK inhibitors are also used for autoimmune diseases. So it, it just highlights yet another connection that we're using the same drugs for myeloproliferative neoplasm as we are for, um, for autoimmune diseases. At your lab, you've been um, very involved with research in NPNs, as you've mentioned, and, um, you know, I'm aware of some of your research into some supplements um, that are being discussed in some of the social media communities and whatnot. So can you tell us a little bit more about um, clinical trials that you're working on in the supplement area? Okay, so thank you for that, for that question. So yes, we are very interested in supplements, um, in particular, we're interested in the antioxidant and acetylcysteine, which actually recently was um, re-designated uh, from a supplement to now, to now a drug. It has been used for many years for Tylenol overdose, as well as um, inhaled um, for kids with cystic fibrosis. So it's, it's, it's really been used extensively um, historically for other, other conditions and is a, a well-known antioxidant. Interestingly, it also has some anti-inflammatory properties. Um, so we were very interested in it because of its, you know, it was a very well, long used um, medication or supplement that, you know, had a really known safety profile, um, was easily accessible by the community, cheap. So we thought that that would be a, you know, a wonderful sort of set of um features for, for something to look at, look at in patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms. Um, and we also look at N-acetylcysteine in a mouse model of JAK2B617F, and those mice usually get blood clots. Um, and we found that N-acetylcysteine prevented blood clots in those mice. Um, also in, in vitro and in the, you know, in test tubes, we could uh, see that the N-acetylcysteine reduced inflammatory um, protein uh, production in both normal controls as well as MTN patients. So we felt that we had a significant amount of preclinical data to support um, testing whether N-acetylcysteine may be helpful in patients with myeloproliferative neoplasm. Um, with any clinical trials, one needs to really go by a step-by-step, -step, um, sort of baby steps to make sure things are safe first. And because N-acetylcysteine had not necessarily been used in the myeloproliferative neoplasm population before, the FDA did want us to do a dose finding study first to identify the optimal dose in the NPN patient population. And that's what we're doing. We're testing three different doses of N-acetylcysteine um, and assessing side effects 
um, as well as efficacy. And it's a short-term efficacy. It's only an eight week where we're putting people on the medication and are, we're trying to um, see an, sort of a, a signal for efficacy as improvement in their MPN symptom burden. Um, and you know, because we have to have each set of three have the eight weeks, and then we need to watch them off of the drug for four weeks to make sure there's no side effects even after they stop the drug. It's quite a, a lengthy process and will take us about at least two years to, um, to acquire the number of patients that we need to identify the appropriate dose. Okay, excellent. So that's really exciting. I know that um, our listeners, um, like to look at natural things like, you know, diet and supplements and exercise. So anytime we can, you know, look at an over-the-counter supplement uh, that may potentially help patients, I think that's a great thing. Yeah, I, I mean, I totally agree. I think that we focus on, you know, these novel drugs and, you know, these, but really, I think most importantly, getting back to the basics of living a healthy lifestyle Eating, eating healthy, exercising really are underestimated the power of these things. I totally agree. I really appreciate you uh, sharing your latest research uh, with us, Dr. Fleischman, and, and thank you for joining us for today's program. Oh, my pleasure. It, it was, a, a, I, as always, I love to talk about uh, myelopathy. 